This is Conversation 12 and details the arrest of Rudy Acosta Jr. This arrest by Jerry and SOS is the touching of the third rail of Chicago politics because Acosta is connected to the most powerful politician in the city. Here's how it all went down. There was a circumstance that evolved that happened where Herrera and Hurley initiated a traffic stop on a van around Archer and Pulaski. And they stopped the vehicle. The vehicle was being driven by an individual named Rudolfo Acosta, but he went by King Rudy was his nickname. He was a maniac disciple, a self-proclaimed record producer, rap record producer. But he also had a front business where he would purchase homes with drug proceeds, uh, flip these homes for a profit. He put a little money into them, make them look a little better than they did when he purchased them originally, and then sell them for a profit. So before he was pulled over, he was on your radar? You guys knew who he was? I did not know who he was. This was after the fact. All of this stuff was after the fact. The first time he was pulled over, this opens the doorway to understanding what he's up to. Yeah, because he it would later tell us in the police station all of this, that he was a record producer. He flipped properties. So he was pretty talkative. Admitted that he was Maniac Land Disciple. But he said he left that alone because he was doing a rap business and he was doing flipping homes. I would later learn that he had other businesses, a glass installation business for automobiles and a rim shop. So Herrera and, and Hurley, we were working in the 8th District, the mission in the 8th District that night. They put a stop at this van. It was a custom van, conversion van. They called us over to location at approximately 49th in Pulaski and said they recovered a gun out of the vehicle. So they placed him in custody. And he gave us an address initially saying he lived with his sister around 46th and Avers, which was like a few blocks away. He said he lived there. We went over there looking for more weapons. We're told that the sister said he doesn't live here. He lives up on the north side. And he had a new townhome he had purchased. So we relocated up to that area looking for more guns and drugs. Went to the house. We went in without a warrant and searched. Are you doing this in the window of time from the moment you arrest him? You're interrogating him and he gives you these addresses. Are you in real time then going to these addresses or are you waiting days thereafter? No, no, immediately. He did not provide us with his address for the new town home that he lived with his wife and children at. We actually found some paperwork in a vehicle, gave us that location. So we relocated to that location. He's a gang member. He's got a gun in the vehicle. We're going to go to his house and look for more guns and dope. So we go to the house. It's a brand new townhome. Very nice. Everything in there is brand new, expensive. His wife is there. Uh, not very upset, but concerned. He just wants to know what's going on with him. And I said, well, he's in custody right now. He's got a gun. You know, we're going to try to work something out. If he can come up with some better information, we'll work something out to flip him for something bigger. Once we're in the house, we see this guy is a pretty big time. I don't care if he says he's in a rap business or he's flipping houses. I mean, he's a gang member, and I know he's in doing the legal stuff. So we find five additional firearms in the house. We did a warrantless search. We have them in a car. We go out and confront them with the five additional guns in the house. And then also, one of the guys I was working with, it might have been Herrera or Hurley, alerted us to the fact that there was a very large safe in the garage. So we went out and asked them, are there more guns in the safe? No. Is there any dope in the, in the safe? No. I said, okay, well, we're, we're going to get a warrant for it if you don't want to cooperate and open it. He goes, I'm not going to open it. I said, okay, that's fine. We're going we're gonna to get a warrant. We're going to open it. Whatever's in it, you're going to get charged with. So all of a sudden, somebody shows up like within minutes, and the guy comes and approaches. He said, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? It's a, it's middle-aged guy. And he goes, uh, that's my son. I said, okay. He identifies himself as uh, Rodolfo Costa. He said, I'm a retired fireman. I said, oh, okay. I said, all right, well, listen, here's what the situation is. We caught your son with a firearm. He has five additional firearms in the house. He's an admitted gang member. And he goes, yeah, he, he, well, that's that's what he used to do. You know, he's changed his life. I said, okay, well, anything's possible. 
So we're talking, and the father mentioned, I work with Alderman Ed Burke. I'm one of his precinct captains, and I keep him straight, and he's turned out to be a good kid. I said, well, listen, I'll take your word for it. But the circumstances dictate right now that he has to go to jail because he was caught with a firearm on the street. He's got five additional unregistered firearms in the house. We're going to have to run his background and see if he's convicted felon. So I told the father, I said, he's got a large safe in there, and we want to know if he has more guns or narcotics in there. So he said, can I talk to him? I go, well, you can't talk to him in private. You can talk to him in front of us. So he says, okay. So we opened the car door, and he said to the son, he goes, what do you have in the safe? And he goes, dad, I'm not going to give them permission to go in the safe. They said, okay, well, we're going to get a warrant, and we're going to get into the safe one way or another. We got him with a gun, and we got five other guns. He's talking more, and then he says, well, and his father and him are next to each other, and he tells his father the combination. So his father, which I think the father had the combination to begin with because, I mean, it was like a second that he walked away. Maybe he's good with numbers. I don't know. So we went in the house. The father punched in the code on the keyboard, and I told him to stand away from the safe because if there's firearms in there, I don't want any mishaps. So open the door, and there was some jewelry in there. Uh, quite a bit of money. So I told the father, that's quite a bit of money to have in your home. Kind of arouses my suspicion that he might be involved in something that you don't know about. And he goes, well, I said, well, here's the deal. It's going to go into the station. You can follow us in there if you want, but we're going to take it into the 17th district and we're going to get to the bottom of it and see how much is there and where he got it. If he has paperwork to prove it's his and how he obtained it, I said, that's going to go for the court system. We got in the station, it was $120,000 in cash. So we charged them with the guns. Uh, we notified organized crime narcotics. They sent somebody out from narcotics to interview him. They had a narcotics dog come out and sniff the money. But like I've told you before, you know, any money, including any money that you have on you, there's money that Joe Biden could be walking around in his pocket. It's going to hit positive on a narcotics dog. That's just a fact. So the money was confiscated. He got a receipt for it, and he got a court date for the guns. His demeanor was good. He never got smart with us, never tried to fight with us or anything. So we took him in. After a little while, it changed in the station. He started threatening us. We're going to have a problem. You don't know who my dad knows. And I said, well, your dad already told me he worked for Ed Burke. And I said, I really don't care who he works for. You're under arrest, and, and it's going to go through the court system. After that was over and the indictments came down, we were told that we went into his house, uh, which we did without a warrant, that we pushed his pregnant wife down the stairs to a straight bullshit. Never happened. First of all, we're not pressed to push any pregnant woman down the stairs. You'd have to be a moron to do that. And if we pushed her down the stairs, uh, she never sought medical treatment, never made a complaint until after the fact. It was just padding the complaint against us. After the case we had him on, he ends up doing a drive-by shooting in the 12th District. He's pursued by the 12th District Police and apprehended on the expressway, and the guns recovered. The victim he shot did not die, but it's still an aggravated battery and an attempt murder. So the state's attorney made a deal with him, and what they did was they used him to say we roughed up his wife and some other things. And they said if he cooperated with them, that they would dismiss the case, the gun case, and the drive-by shooting case. And it just so happened that his father was Ed Burke's top precinct captain. So that didn't hurt. So I think with everything said and done, I think Burke made a phone call to the state's attorney's office and the case went away on this guy. His case went away because he turned on you guys? That's correct. So the state was using a guy who is a, I don't know at this point he's convicted, but he's busted in a drive-by shooting. Yeah, and he has other rap. Yeah, he's got a rap sheet, but they are taking his word. They're horse trading his word to put you guys away and his convictions evaporate. Or not put you guys away, but to start going after you guys. Yeah, and it didn't hurt the fact that his father was the top captain for Ed Burke, probably the most powerful in the city at the time. 
he sat on the Cook County Democratic Committee for judicial recommendations and appointments. So in order to be a judge in Cook County as a Democrat, you had to go through Burke. This is just another example of the incestuous web of corruption in Chicago. Inevitably, you're running into somebody who's connected to power. And Acosta had the power, obviously. He did the dirty work for Burke, so he's going to go to Burke, no question. Probably the first call he made when he left his son's house was to Burke. I'm sure it's coincidental that two of the state's attorneys that were prosecuted us after our case became Cook County judges. And who were they? Uh, Anna Demacopoulos and David, got a Hispanic last name. It'll come to me. But they were two of the prosecutors of the three on the case. They were appointed Cook County judges. That was the first instance of me having an, an issue with somebody who was connected to an alderman, uh, someone like Burke, who was powerful. Dad had been the alderman for a long time, and then he succeeded him, and he was the longest-serving alderman and a very powerful person. And he had friends on the police department, friends in the state's attorney's office. He had senators and congressmen and everything that are probably beholden to him one way or another because his ward would bring out the vote, vote for them. Come across somebody like that, it was the first time for me. It was a little too late, and, and the thing was, we're not going to let a guy go we got six guns from. You know, after his dad kind of made, you know, the innuendo that he was a Burke guy. And I'm like, eh, he's got to go. And then let Burke do whatever he's got to do. That's not my problem. I mean, apparently it turned out to be our problem. Now, there were a number of things with him, uh, Acosta. He fired off uh, a shotgun on a balcony in the South Loop in a condo he owned down there. Police responded and they arrested him. There's a number, a number of things with him. Besides the drive-by shooting that he walked away from, the FBI were later able to get him and put him away. Shed light on when you downloaded to the FBI about Acosta, what was their response to what you were telling them? When I had the proper to take my plea agreement, to tell them everything I did, legal, they asked me about Acosta, the incident. I told them his wife being pushed down the stairs. I, I kind of laughed. I said, please. And they think, is that funny? I go, yes. It's pretty hilarious, to be honest with you. I go, nobody in their right fucking mind is going to push a pregnant woman down the stairs, okay? Uh, maybe on TV, but that doesn't happen in real life because you got to be out of your fucking mind to do something bad. Because if she has a miscarriage or if she breaks her neck, you're going to prison. So I said, I don't care what she said or what he said. She didn't get pushed up the stairs. And I said, this guy is a fucking dope dealing gangbanger. Well, how do you know that? I said, well, you guys are the investigators. Investigate him. I said, I guarantee you're going to come up with something on this guy. ATF or the DEA, I think it was, I think it might have been ATF. And he fought with them. He got one of their agents jammed up because I think the agent punched him. And one of the other agents snitched on him because they were fighting, tussling on the ground. The agent punched Acosta and he made a complaint about it. Ultimately, I got a letter from my attorney when I was in prison. And it was a article from the Chicago Tribune about a cop that being arrested in Orland Park. They found 20 plus kilos in his home and a number of firearms, uh, rifles. And my lawyer said, I never doubted you. Uh, was a personal note he sent in there. Took him a little while. They got him. The kid was a shit bag all around. So was his dad. Between a Rudy Acosta senior and junior affair, you've got that kind of sphere You've got two incidences that may have been on separate tracks. You've got Brzezinski and the insurance fraud, which I chuckle at it because it's so bonehead, it's mind-numbing. But that could have been the first domino. What was the timeline between these two things? Probably about maybe a year, maybe a little more than a year. In addition to that, the 23rd Ward incident with the ward superintendent being arrested on Bart Maka's search warrant was an, another political heavyweight. I mean, very well, uh, those could have been the things that started the investigation, I'm sure. They like to use the false narrative that we did not go to court. We're not showing up on our court cases. That, in fact, was not the case. Brzezinski was the first cooperator, and then the other two cases all were used in conjunction and were 
able to disappear because of our indictments. You mentioned this the war superintendent. Do you want to dive into that a little bit? This guy was the war superintendent for the 23rd Ward. I don't remember his name. He was replaced by somebody else, but he was still in with the ward. He didn't have a city job anymore, city position anymore. And Bart Markov, he got some information from a business owner, a Polish couple, who ran a, a restaurant bar around Archer and Kilpatrick, which was in the 23rd Ward. They informed Maka that this guy was kind of squeezing him for money and still acting like he was the ward superintendent. He carried a badge, identified him, himself as such. They told him this guy had offered them drugs and other stuff. So Maka had a search warrant typed up, and we executed a search warrant out of this guy's house. And we recovered a bunch of uh, the mushrooms. They're uh, hallucinogenic. And they're illegal. We arrested him. So we got some pushback from one of the bosses in the 8th District with a police lieutenant. And he came and talked to us and asked us if we could do anything. And I said, this is not my search warrant. And it's really not my paper. I mean, it's MAPA's. So, I mean, I really can't do anything about it. This guy was arrested, processed. It made the media. Because he said he was a ward superintendent at one time. And he still had the identification. So there was a little pressure from that. And I think that that was another thing that might have caused us an issue because it was political. Maka made the one up. No one had it signed by a judge. So it was all legal. Probably not in our best interest to have executed that one on this guy. How often does this happen? Interaction with people who are connected to political apparatus, making threats. And when it does happen, do people back off? More times than not. Early in my career, I locked up uh, an assistant attorney general on the bus, working special employment for the CTA downtown. I was on Michigan Avenue, and this guy was a little guy. I don't know if he had, uh, you know, that little man complex or what. Very intoxicated. I was standing in the aisle of the bus, riding the bus, because that's what I was paid to do on patrol. He pushed past me, but he barreled into me. He goes, what the fuck are you standing in the aisle for? So I followed him down off the bus. And I said, hey, step over here. He said, what, what's the issue here, man? And he's like, who the fuck do you think you are? And it's not. So he said something else. And, and I said, go out, have a good night. He said, fuck you. You think you're, you're some tough guy because you're a cop and it's not. So it got heated. And I threw a cuffs on him and arrested him. Not for battery or anything because he fucking knocked into me and almost knocked me over in the seat. But because... He was drunk and disorderly. So I took him into the station and, and, you know, he told me I just fucked up that pile of bricks was going to fall on me. And he was an assistant attorney general. So I had him in there and I called the watch commander out and I said, well, you might want to come and see this guy, boss, who's in the first district. He says he's an assistant attorney general, Illinois. He said, okay. So he walked back there and he goes, what's going on tonight? And the guy says, fuck you. He goes, you fucking cunt and this and that. The lieutenant said, put him in the back, lock him up, fuck him. I don't know if the guy lost his job or not, but you get threatened all the time. I'm going to call the alderman. I'm going to call the mayor. But if I heard, I'm going to call the mayor, fucking, I, I can't even count on my hands how many times I heard that. It's like any other city, politics, it's like any other suburb. Fucking people, they have a little power. Even myself, as police officers, we abused our power. Doing shit we shouldn't have did. Not minimizing what I did. Stealing money, totally illegal. I fucked up. I had the best job in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Was happy doing it. Went down the wrong road. Greed got the best of me. I figured to make light of it, well, it's drug money. It's not going to hurt anybody. What did? It hurt me. It hurt my family. Cost me my career. Cost me my freedom. This is Chicago. This is Illinois. It is a corrupt fucking place to the hilt. In Cook County. And it's a good word and a good term. Cook County. But you're not going to tell me that those fucking state's attorneys didn't make judge by helping that a cop out. Because Burke's the guy, he was making judges. So I guarantee it. I guarantee that those people got rewarded. You're not going to tell me that this fucking thug gangbanger and his father didn't go and whine for this guy. Because that was their guy. And that's the way shit works in this city. So I'm sure he made some phone calls or met with somebody to put a word in somebody else's ears. Do you think they gave a fuck about a bunch of gangbangers 
they said we were going out there and robbing innocent people and regular people. That's a fucking lie. That is a farce. The whole fucking deal was a, that was the biggest joke I've ever heard. I never stole money from anybody who was a decent working person. Never. These guys were all fucking gangbangers, all dope dealers. Does it make it right? No. But they try to embellish on it and say, oh, this rogue group of officers, they were stealing from innocent people. Really? Who the fuck were the innocent people? Every one of those people were tied up in narcotics. Or they were gangbangers. One article wrote about me that said that we raided an old woman's birthday party, a grandmother's birthday party. Oh, yeah, it was a grandmother's birthday party, but it was being run by her grandchildren and the fucking grandchildren, the boy side, they were all two six gangbangers and we fucking recovered a shitload of guns and dope out of that house that night. So, yeah, okay, it was grandmother's birthday party, but oh well. It wasn't some fucking innocent lady fucking having a party with her 60 or 70 friends that were in her 80s and 90s. A bunch of fucking thug gangbangers were there with long guns, we found semi-automatic rifles in the house, a bunch of dope, and we fought with those fuckers. Everybody went to jail, including grandmother. And everybody went to jail that night except for the dog because everybody was fighting with us, jumping on us, biting us. So, oh well. You can write anything you want. The fucking newspapers are garbage anyway. I mean, you know, they're one-sided. Another lady said she knew me and she knew I would go looking because I would go looking to steal cocaine. Well, that's pretty funny because all the cocaine I recovered went to the police crime lab. I would be a millionaire, Neil, these days if I sold those drugs. Millions and millions of dollars. It is what it is now. I can't change the story. And this is Chicago, and if you know the right people, cases can disappear. Uh, we've seen that in the past. They painted me as the most corrupt police officer in the city's history. Okay, okay. If that's what they want to say, but the, all the guns and, and drugs were turned in. And I didn't murder anybody. And I wasn't putting false cases on people. I didn't imprison people falsely. So if I was the most corrupt police officer, oh, that's a pretty low bar. So why do these three things feel like they were woven together? All the fucking gangbangers and the shit bags didn't make a difference. But when you start ruffling the feathers of people who have some type of political clout, that's going to hurt you and make a difference. Because that's when something's going to happen. And I think that's what happened. We fucked up and fucked with the wrong people. Okay, I want to pause here for a moment and talk about Ed Burke. The conversation that Jerry and I are having was recorded in September of 2023. Ed Burke had been indicted and was awaiting trial for two and a half years, I believe. Because of COVID, his trial continued to push. But just last week, he was convicted on 13 of 14 charges. And let me read from the Chicago Tribune. This is Ray Long, Jason Meisner, and Megan Kripal. Former Chicago Alderman Ed Burke's verdict stands out in long arc of city council crooks. Generations of Chicagoans accustomed to grimy politics might view former Alderman Ed Burke's federal racketeering conviction last week as just another case in a long conga line of crooked aldermen. But Burke was the undisputed Democratic kingpin. He not only set a record for serving 54 years in the city council, but he departed in May as the last alderman who rose to power in the era of Mayor Richard J. Daley's vaunted Democrat machine. And as such, his downfall will reverberate in City Hall history. Days after a federal jury convicted Burke on all but one of the 14 counts against him, friends and foes alike remain stunned that Burke, who was once viewed as untouchable, is now a convicted felon. Found guilty by a jury of using his public position to leverage property tax appeal business for his law firm, Burke, who turns 80 on Friday, is looking at a potential long term in prison. The pre Christmas verdict also capped a year of extraordinary public corruption victories racked up by federal prosecutors in cases arising from a sweeping investigation of ex Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan, the once all powerful state Democratic Party chairman. Burke's conviction 
and Madigan's upcoming federal corruption trial marked the end of an era for the two legendary Southwest Side Democrats from neighboring wards who long held almost unchecked political power. In addition, the jurors on Thursday did far more than topple Burke, a stalwart political figure with old-school connections and a wife, Anne, who was once the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. They did what very few of his fiercest political enemies could ever do. They humbled him. The article goes on. This is a fine point about Ed Burke, his power, his corruption, and now his conviction at 80. Let's transition from Burke to... The Acostas, Sr. and Jr. Jerry discussed Jr. and his legal issues and run-ins with the law once Jerry went to jail. That's the mid-2000s, 2006, seven. But Rudy Acosta Jr.'s issues and involvement with the FBI and the state's attorney's office continued on all the way up till September 2023. And I'm going to read from this article in the Chicago Tribune. This is dated September 19th, 2023. Headline, one-time rap mogul Rudy Acosta, known for castle-like mansion along Kennedy Expressway, gets a year in prison in, quote, extraordinary, unquote, drug case. This is by a writer named Jason Meisner. Rudy Acosta III, a one-time gangster rap impresario and real estate mogul known for the castle-like home he built along the Kennedy Expressway, was sentenced to one year in prison Tuesday for trafficking hundreds of kilograms of cocaine before flipping and helping prosecutors build cases against his suppliers. The sentencing before U.S. Judge Robert Gettleman wrapped up in an extraordinary legal saga that began nearly eight years ago when Acosta was arrested and accused in a dramatic court hearing with threatening to kill the wife and children of a courier he thought had stolen his cocaine. Later, Acosta made the dangerous decision to cooperate against figures with connections to Mexican cartels, an effort so sensitive it had to be kept from his then-criminal defense attorney out of the worry the information would be leaked on the street, according to records and court statements. Acosta's predicament also led to cooperation of his father, Rudy Acosta Sr., a longtime precinct captain for then 14th Ward Alderman Edward Burke, who helped develop evidence in a sprawling public corruption probe against a number of elected officials and political operatives, prosecutors said. In all, prosecutors said the younger Acosta's cooperation led either directly or indirectly to 36 people being federally charged, including public corruption and major drug cases that involved more than a dozen wiretaps and the seizure of several million dollars in drug proceeds and 100 kilograms of cocaine and heroin. Let me read further down. Acosta pleaded guilty in April to a single count of narcotics trafficking, admitting in a plea agreement with prosecutors that he had coordinated distribution of hundreds of kilograms of cocaine dating back to the 1990s, establishing stash houses around the Chicago area, working his way up the chain with Mexico-based suppliers. Acosta's lawyer, Lopez, posted on social media that the Acostas were, quote, a family of rats, unquote, and said Acosta, quote, was a Satan disciple who turned informant on other folks in his circle, unquote. Quote, King Rudy turned into Fruity Tootie Rudy, unquote, Lopez wrote. Lopez's wife, Lisa, represented one of the co-defendants in that trial. Acosta was also in the news for run-ins with the law. In 2004, Acosta was arrested for allegedly pointing a gun through the window of his car at Archer Avenue and Pulaski Road, records show. Chicago police later said they found four guns, $112,000 in cash hidden in a safe in his home. But the charges were dropped because the police who arrested him were part of the corrupt special operations section. Now, this is the bit I wanted to get in here, and then we'll be done with this. Acosta's father, who was estranged from his son for years, spent decades around some of Chicago's most colorful and allegedly corrupt politicians, watching as a succession of his political mentors were hit with federal charges. Among them was Alderman Fred Rohde, the mob-connected leader of the old First Ward who went to prison for bribery, former state Senator Martin Sandoval, who pleaded guilty to bribery before dying of COVID-19 complications in 2020, and Burke, who's going on trial on sweeping, racketeering charges in November. It goes on, Acosta Sr., 72, pleaded guilty to misleading the FBI in a series of interviews in 2017 and 18 about its investigation into Sandoval and other elected officials. He was given probation. The older Acosta is now suffering from a form of dementia and wasn't in court Tuesday where new details of his own cooperation came to light. 
further it goes, detailing the Acosta family and all their glory. Let's end there. Next up is conversation 13. Jerry is arrested by the FBI and ends up in solitary confinement in the MCC for four years. 